So welcome. Um, my name is Carla Trelaw. I'm from the Centre for Social Research and Health at UNSW. And we are um, talking today about bystander interventions for stigma reduction. So I'm going to start by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Eleanor Karma who's going to introduce our speakers for today. Over to you Eleanor. Thank you. So I'm Eleanor. I'm part of the stigma team at the Centre for Social Research in Health. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Associate Professor Anne Bagchi, um, whose work has focused on health equity among marginalised populations. And like Carla said, she's here to talk to us about bystander interventions for HIV stigma. And I'm also really pleased to introduce John Gobey, who is the relatively new CEO of AVIL, which is our national peak body for people who use drugs. Um, and he's our community respondent today. So I'll pass over to Anne. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I'm going to share my slide deck. And I I also want to say in New Jersey, we, we acknowledge that New Jersey was originally Lenape land. Um, so most of our Housing and businesses are built on traditional Lenape um, territory. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I am a professor, so of course I had to have a slide deck. Um, I can't say I'm I'm the greatest greatest at producing slides, so not particularly interesting. But in any case, I wanted to run through just very briefly, kind of how this uh, what I call the step up to stamp out stigma. So step up SOS, how it develops and is based based on research that I've conducted. So uh, I wanted to start by giving a, a few acknowledgements. Um, William Holzemer, he is, was been my mentor at the University, uh, Rutgers University in the School of Nursing. Um, he is internationally known in his work in uh, stigma and quality of life for people living with HIV. Dolores Dockery, um, I don't know if anybody on the, on the call New Dolores, um, she was also internationally known advocate for people living with HIV. Um, sadly, she passed from COVID um, in the early days of the COVID pandemic, so in, in April of 2020. And then Dwight Peavy, who's another dear colleague of mine. Um, all three of these folks were have been mentors to me and have informed my research, and none of this would be possible without their, um, their guidance and their mentorship. Um, so I'm going to go through some background studies uh, that I've done with, with all of these folks, um, give a brief description of the Step Up uh, SOS intervention. I do have that slide deck up in case anybody wants to see sections of that at some point, but um, talk about kind of how it's being currently applied, and then address any questions that anyone may have before we move on to expert. So uh, starting with the background study. So one of the first studies that um, the Bill and I did was uh, Bill had developed some, some workshop-based, uh, clinic-based workshops in Africa. And so we had used his initial work to test uh, a clinic-based intervention in, in um, New Jersey. So the workshops were held with staff and clients at a local HIV service organization in Newark, New Jersey, which really has the high, well, I'm not sure if it's still the case, uh, but it has had one of the highest rates of HIV infection um, in all the United States. And um, it was really one of the first areas where uh, people were diagnosed in the 1980s. So this clinic that we did this workshops in is one of the uh, most progressive, largest, and kind of a one-stop shop clinic uh, in New York. Um, so, as I mentioned, they were based, this study was based on the workshops that were developed in African health clinics. And what we did was we had four three hour meetings that were held over the course of two weeks. We conducted baseline and follow up questionnaires, um, including the burger scale for people living with HIV. And then we had clinic workers. Um, we don't know what any of their status were. That wasn't a question that came up, but we did measure their levels of stigma as well pre post uh, intervention. Our main findings were that uh, the Burger stigma scale scores significantly decreased uh, after, before and after the, the two-week workshop. However, we did 
check it again a year later, and that de decrease was not sustained. Um, among the staff, there was a negative decrease, but um, the staff at this clinic had very low le levels of stigma in the first place. So, um, And the participants, including the staff, um, in 2010, the National HIV AIDS Strategy was introduced, and um, these workshops were held in 2015, but most of the participants, and like I said, even the staff members, were not aware of the strategy. So we found that to be a pretty interesting finding. So the main implication we took out of this study is that if you're gonna do work like this, uh, it, it may be beneficial, but you probably need to do some kind of booster sessions. And so another big study, this was with Dolores's um, intervention and um, Dwight, Dolores and Dwight you know, provide a lot of assistance with this. So we implemented the People Living with HIV Stigma Index in New Jersey. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the People Living with HIV Stigma Index. Um, at the time that we used it, and this again was in 2016, I think, it was basically a 40 page <laughs> survey instrument. Um, I don't know if it's been revised much since then. I think they've been working on making revisions, but the stigma index has been used in countries all around the world. Um, our application of it was one of the first, it was the second application in the United States and the first and only statewide application uh, of this tool. And so it was funded by the New Jersey Department of Health. It was a collaborative effort uh, with cooperation with the members of the New Jersey HIV AIDS Planning Group, which is a statewide um, coalition, I would say, of individuals living with HIV, organizations, uh, government entities, all working together to address HIV um, prevention and care um, in the United States. So we completed 371 interviews um, across uh, we used a 1% representative sample across all of 21, all 21 of New Jersey's counties. Um, there were only two counties where we didn't get any interviews. Um, the other 19, we had at least some, uh, I think we met our targets for all of those uh, counties. So we got a good representation, uh, cross-representation of people living with HIV in New Jersey. And we also used quota sampling for underrepresented groups. So uh, transgender women, um, people who inject drugs. And one of the main reasons we did this study was that anecdotally people had been saying that they were experiencing stigma in healthcare settings. And so we thought, we'll, we'll do the stigma index, we'll see what kinds of stigma people are experiencing, and then we'll develop interventions for healthcare providers to address that stigma. Surprisingly, what we found was there was very little stigma reported from healthcare providers. Now, keep in mind, these are surveys done with people living with HIV. And the main question that informed that um, assumption was, in the past 12 months, have you felt stigmatized by a physician, a nurse, a social worker? So they had a bunch of categories of healthcare providers. And the only one, that, well, I should say, the one that got the highest endorsement was stigma from physicians, but only 20 people out of the 371 people interviewed reported ex having experienced that type of stigma in the past 12 months. It may be that um, because we were working with agencies that serve people with HIV, we didn't capture people who aren't being seen and they may you know, be the people who have more stigma and they avoid healthcare settings because they feel stigmatized. So there could be that kind of bias. There also could be bias in terms of, well, maybe in the last Last 12 months, I haven't experienced stigma, but longer ago I have. And in fact, what we found at the end of the stigma index survey are some open-ended questions. And most, I forget what the percentage is, but a large percentage of people who participated in the survey had been living with HIV for at least 10 years. So many people have been living with it for even 15 or 20 years. Uh, keep in mind, New Jersey was one of the first states where uh, cases of AIDS were identified. So. Um, and what was what was interesting is that a lot of people said back when I was diagnosed, so 10 or 15, 20 years ago, and that stigma still lives with them, you know, so that's, uh, that's, that's a really critical to me, a really critical component of addressing stigma is understanding that when people feel stigmatized, it, it can be a lifelong damage that they're experiencing. And so the major findings from this, there was no real evidence of significant 
stigma among healthcare workers, the most common source of stigma reported was gossip. So about 50% of people said they had experienced stigma in the form of gossip. Um, and that was also the type of stigma they feared the most was being gossiped about. So the implication is um, that I took away was there was a need for community-based interventions that could focus on gossip. So since we didn't find stigma among healthcare providers from clients' perspective, we thought let's do a survey of healthcare providers. And this is one, again, I worked on with Bill. So this was an online survey of healthcare personnel regarding HIV-related stigma. It was not limited to HIV-related healthcare settings or specific occupations. So a person could be working in any kind of healthcare setting. It could be the janitor, it could be a lawyer, it could be a physician, it, it didn't matter. Um, and we use the uh, NIDLADE's uh, measure of HIV stigma and discrimination healthcare facility staff question for this study. And uh, we included separate questions related to, to PrEP, attitudes towards PrEP. And so what we found again, no evidence of st significant stigma among healthcare workers that participate. We had about 276 responses. Um, not a representative sample by any means, it was just whoever answered the, the survey. So you know, take that for what it's worth. But, but one thing we did find is that 85% of respondents would ever witness stigma did nothing, they didn't intervene. And so the implication to me again was that there's a need for interventions to empower community commitment to stigma reduction. So if you see something, say something. And so that's how um, the Step Up SOS intervention came about. Um, it's based on a, a bystander intervention that was developed at the University of Arizona. So a lot of uh, universities in the United States, I don't know about other places, Places, but in the United States, a lot of universities have this type of training um, regarding sexual violence. So to prevent um, situations from escalating. And the example they give is, um, you know, a young woman's at a, a frat party and she's had a lot to drink and someone is taking her upstairs to where the bedrooms are. Um, and the idea is that people should recognize that maybe she's not able to give consent, maybe something needs to be done about that. So that's that was the example that the University of Arizona gave for how they developed this program. So the basis of step, step up to stamp out stigma is kind of the that idea, recognizing when um, stigma could be happening. And it's really intended for community-based settings. Um, it uses multiple evidence-based approaches um, to stigma reduction. So um, it is a workshop type of training. So um, ideally the person, a person living with HIV would be the one to uh, lead the training. So you have that contact, which is one evidence-based based approach to, to stigma reduction. Uh, it provides education. So part of the training is to address myths about HIV and provide information, current information. Um, it has peer support. So it's really intended for people living with HIV, friends, family members, healthcare workers, community members, uh, pretty pretty much any kind of community-based setting, you could run the workshops. And the idea is to create a community environment where stigma is um, recognizable and unacceptable, and that people feel empowered. Not to, so much is placed on the people living with HIV to, to be empowered and step up for themselves, but the idea is to create a more holistic kind of approach that addresses community norms and the way people behave towards one another. And then we do have some skill building, participatory learning. Um, we have open discussions. Uh, there's a, a role play based on the theater of the oppressed, which um, that approach has people who are watching. They're, they're not considered spectators. They're considered spec actors. So what you do is you start a role play and then you ask people for their input and people who have suggestions on how things could be done differently, you ask them to come into the role play and show you know, how they might approach something. The other thing we do that's very popular with this is, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of a snowball survey, but at one point during the training, we wanna elicit real life examples that people have either experienced or witnessed related to stigma. And so what we do is we have them write down on a piece of paper, um, something that they've experienced or seen. And we ask them, don't write your name. 
down on the piece of paper. And so once everybody's done writing, you have them ball up their paper into a ball and then they, they have like a snowball fight. So they throw the, the balls of paper around the room and then it kind of mixes everything up. And then everybody picks up a, a snowball and in that way, it's anonymous. Um, who wrote down whatever it is you're reading? People read them out and we discuss that. That's always a very popular activity, but it's part of the participatory learning that's involved. And then it's also designed to address multiple types of stigma, um, internalized stigma, enacted, associated, structural stigma. Um, the, the beginning of the training kind of goes through what is stigma? It starts with the definition. Because one of the things I found when I was doing the, when I was, going around the state, trying to um, give information about the stigma index study, I would go to groups of people living with HIV and we'd talk about, oh, we're gonna do the study, it's gonna address stigma, blah, blah, blah. And people would say, oh, that's great. I love that idea, but, but what's stigma? What do you mean by that? And it just, as a sociologist, I forgot to say that up front, I'm, I'm a sociologist and a family nurse a practitioner. So for me, as a sociologist, like stigma is, that was, um, the discipline that really defined stigma from the very beginning with Irving Goffman's work. So for me, it's just second nature, but that's when you realize uh, not everybody is on the same page. So we start out with a discussion of what do we mean by stigma? So some current applications. I've been running a series of trainings through the New Jersey HIV Training Capacity Development. Um, these, are, these trainings are mostly people who work in Ryan White funded agencies. So Ryan White is the federal program in the United States set aside specifically uh, for funding to provide care and services for people living with HIV. And so, so far, all the people who've participated in this training uh, through Step Up are people who work with people living with HIV. But ideally, it's not just those kinds of contexts as I mentioned before. Uh, there, we do have pilot money. Uh, a colleague of mine works in the Cancer Institute, so we have uh, some funding to look at uh, tobacco-related stigma in people with lung cancer. Um, still waiting for, for those to be um, set up, for the, the actual training to, to be set up, but that's something that we're looking at. Other uses that I've proposed, unfortunately haven't gotten funded yet, incorporating this type of stigma training for community health workers. Um, and not just related to HIV, but um, related to mild to moderate depression among African-American churchgoers. That was one specific um, training I recommended um, or that I proposed to do. And I've, I don't know if I said this up front, but the, the step up intervention was originally developed for HIV, but the way I see it, it could really be used and uh, applied to any type of health related stigma. And so that's why I mentioned mild to moderate depression and management of alcohol use disorder among uh, Latina lesbians. These are two proposals I put into the National Institutes of Health here in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, they have not been funded and you know, keep trying. <laughs> um, and then, as I said before, um, trying to implement this HIV related training or other health related stigma training in other community based settings. So that are some of the proposed uses. So um, this is my contact information. I think I'll just, uh, Stop sharing now, because I'm sure um, Carla and Elena can share my contact information as needed. But um, that was just the background I wanted to give. And so I'll open it up either questions or if this is when uh, John wants to, to say something first. Um, I'll, I'll let Carla add your email into the chat so that people can contact you directly. Thank you so much for that. So we might leave questions to the end and pass over to John. Thanks, John. Thank you so much, Anne. That was such an amazing presentation, and there's so much content in there, so much information that are fantastic. That is fantastic. Um, so I'm John. I'm the CEO of ABLE, the Australian Injector, um, and it's a drug user league. Uh, so we've been doing harm reduction for 30 years, but um, here started with um, the community-led response um, to the HIV crisis, but for people who use drugs, especially people who inject drugs. Um, myself, um, I was working before working at ABLE at NUA, so the New South Wales um, member organization of ABLE, um, in the, the same mindset as well, for people who inject drugs during the HIV crisis, and now uh, doing also some AOD work. And previously, I was working for ACON, so the AIDS Council of New South Wales, um, especially they bring peer services and um, especially related to, to testing. 
Um, so I'm speaking today from a personal experience, from a community experience, from a work experience, uh, but I am not a researcher or sociologist by any means. Um, so take everything I say um, as you know my personal experience. <laughs> um, I think from what I heard from Anne as well, Sigma is such a big, important um, piece of work that we need to tackle all together. Um, investing in community and empowering community is so important here in Australia. Um, so I'm Canadian, but since I've been here in Australia, I saw really amazing, some amazing work here from, you know, the AIDS Council, the, the Body Positive, um, the, the peer-led organization for positive people here in Australia, but also from um, the organization for people who use drugs. Um, you can really see there's an amazing effort here to work all together to tackle stigma in many different ways. Um, but in my work at ACON, both in LHD settings, so local health districts, or um, in like peer-led services at ACON, um, I can really, I could really feel the stigma from um, the internalized stigma that people have when they struggle to access services. It could be um, the intersectionality as well. If you're someone who's culturally and linguistically diverse, if you're someone who's gender diverse, um, if you're obviously gay as well, um, if you're someone who comes from a background or there was already a lot of stigma uh, within your family uh, to discuss sexuality, to discuss testing, to access those services. Um, so it was an interesting experience to be able to deliver the best services and adapt to everyone that was coming through um, and to make sure that they feel supported, they feel welcome, um, and that they feel safe in that environment. And I could say that in my work at ACON, I could see um, the effort of that organization to make sure that even um, externally, there's a lot of promotion and, and a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of efforts uh, to make sure that the stigma is relieved at least temporarily to make sure that people feel comfortable sometimes giving a call to access for example counseling services or to make their way to one of the the clinics so that's an amazing work on the side of our AIDS councils but also um from my members so people who use drugs um those PLM organization I can really see the amazing work that they've done through you know those 30 years um, really delivering peer-led services. So I think that's really key. I think Anne kind of touched upon it as well by empowering community, but having those peer-led services makes such a huge difference to reduce stigma because, you know, you can talk to someone that understands where you're coming from. Uh, it doesn't matter, really matter if you're gender diverse or you're someone who uses drugs, like talking to someone that really can connect with you and understand where you're coming from. Even though everyone is different, we all have different experiences. Um, it doesn't mean that the person in front of you has the exact same experience, but having someone who understands at least maybe even the struggle to come to that services or to, you know, to give a call, it really makes a difference. Um, and I can see here in Australia that there's really a movement into trying to reduce stigma by having more peer-led services, investing in peer workforce development. And here at ABLE, um, that's one of the main priorities to really develop that uh, peer workforce, make sure we have national standards, make sure that we have investment from the government into peers that it's recognized as well. It does make a difference because, um, so I live with someone who has um, HIV and um, my flatmate actually went to um, the Body Positive um, organization here in New South Wales to do some training. And I think that links really well with what Anne was saying, going to those trainings to talk about stigma, to talk about um, how to safely disclose and to do that in an environment where you are only with people also that have HIV for the first time to be able to feel comfortable with no pressure of doing it. But um, so that's what I remember from that the conversation with my flatmate, um, to be able to feel com confident to talk about those things and kind of tackle slowly the stigma that you have internalized with those kind of things. And with all community members, people who use drugs, um, we have we had so many conversations about the fact that, for example, you know, if you're at an airport or you talk to a police officer about something else, you can have that internal stigma really coming back up. And that's really difficult. And sometimes people can feel it coming and that prevents them from accessing services, health services, counseling, um, going to the authorities for X, Y, Z reason. Um, so stigma really prevents people from living their healthier and happier lives. It, uh, it affects them in their daily lives. Um, it also can affect you to the point of like mental health um, struggles. 
and it just disconnects you from your community as well. Because if you think about so I'm a gender diverse person, and I know that one of the stigma <laughs> issues that I have is sometime when I know I'm going to go into a very straight environment or into a very gay environment, sometimes I struggle with how people will perceive my presence and how we're going to communicate in terms of like pronouns and in terms of um, how am I supposed to act in that capacity and can I be myself or do I need to modify with the environment so I can pass and not have the issue or the difficult conversation or the judgment being present and I think sometimes you know it just it becomes kind of second nature and the problem is if you think too much I can prevent you from just even going and even like seeking those uh, beautiful opportunities to connect with the community or as I said, accessing services, it's so important that for health reasons, if you want to get tested, if you want to, you know, get safe uh, needle and syringe, um, that you feel comfortable doing so. Um, and I was talking with Anne before about um, the stigma that some people have to accessing um, needle and syringe programs already get it inside the building. So there's kind of almost a physical reaction where the closer you get to the location, then the more the anxiety and the stigma really kind of raise. And then people will end up using a vending machine, which is fantastic, better than nothing, but they don't get inside to connect with a peer or with a community worker to discuss other things. And that would reduce stigma over time to really have that connection um, and make you feel comfortable to be who you are and um, to live in case of, in the case of people living with HIV as a non um, HIV positive person. Um, my understanding is that, you know, to really be yourself fully and live as a beautiful, positive person, being connected to your community makes such a big difference. And having those positive experiences of going to a clinic and having an amazing service, not just an okay service that the GP didn't judge you or that the pharmacist didn't judge you, but that you didn't feel judged, but that on top of that, they really kind of they had that training to be able to deliver a top-notch service where you felt, wow, I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt, I even felt I could say that I'm HIV positive or that um, I'm a gender diverse person. I feel very comfortable doing so. And that reduces the stigma. And that's a story I, I hear quite often here in Sydney. We're very lucky, you know, the city is, um, you know, the biggest hub here in Australia. And you can hear that community members talk between themselves on like what clinic to go to, what services to go to, what is the feedback that they had. So when they go there, they already feel a bit better. And then when they get a great service and they recommend to other people. So there's kind of that natural stigma prevention strategy happening here. And I'm sure it's everywhere the same. I believe in, in Canada was the same in Vancouver as well with community where people will feel comfortable going to ask questions because it was a beautiful queer hub where people would just go and ask their question, get tested. So reducing the stigma and creating community and investing in community and I would say organizational readiness. In my experience in the local health district, it's so important that we don't assume that people know and um, that we give them the proper training and that links really well with what I'm just saying to make sure that there's a really amazing level of training. And I would say peer, peer co-design as well, co-design with people that have those experiences, even delivered as I would say uh, by people with um, that lived experience to really make sure the training um, goes a long way and is sustainable. And in my experience, nursing staff and uh, GPs are actually really comfortable asking questions um, once they feel that there's a safe space for them to ask the, the real question, like if they don't believe in pronouns or if they, they, they don't understand what queer means um, or things like that, that they can ask the question. And with HIV, because there's a medical side of things, then also to make sure they can understand more the experiences of people with HIV um, or people who use drugs because we're very stigmatized as well when people go into hospital settings. So I think organizational readiness is really key and it needs to be co-designed and data verge by peers um, to make sure that it's sustainable and it's well done and people really get the information that they need to deliver the best services and also become allies to that community of people living with HIV or of people using drugs. Thanks, John. You know, if, if I could just respond to, to John's comments, there were a few things that I wanted to point out, both about the training, how it developed. Um, so this point about making sure that people living with HIV are involved in the development. Um, that was definitely the case. I mean, the people who served on my team were people on my research team were people living with HIV. It was informed by the stigma index. Um, we also did a pilot study with input from people living with HIV. And it, that is just really critical. The other thing um, 
that I try to focus on. And, you know, again, if we could do this in a, a broader community based setting, I think this would work even better. But the idea is that I want people living with HIV to, to understand too, and, and people in the broader community that HIV affects everybody through associated stigma, through all these other factors. And, you know, not not to discount or to, to lessen in any way the, the stigma experienced by people living with HIV, but hopefully for them to understand that part of the reason they're being stigmatized is because other people feel stigmatized. And that's that's the whole idea behind this intervention is addressing stigma at a structural level, level thinking of community norms and behaviors as part of the structure of society and breaking that down. Um, and that's a, it's a kind of difficult concept for lay individuals to kind of wrap their heads around. But I think the way I like to present it is voting is a healthcare issue. Because if you're someone imprisoned and you don't have the right to vote, at least in the United States, that happens in some states, then you don't get a say over what healthcare decisions are made that affect you. So voting is a structural, one of these high level decisions that's built into the way society is set up and structured that affects your health outcomes. And so I, I think people kind of understand that when you start to explain it and racism, some of these other intersectional um, stigmas and discrimination that, that John brought up. So these are all really important things. The other thing I just wanted to be sure to share with people in this group, I'm gonna put the, um, the link here in the chat. Uh, a friend of mine, Michael Hager, is uh, leading this, this study, My Voices Are Stories, and it's another stigma reduction kind of initiative. I don't know if anybody's heard about this, but, um, but what they're doing is they're running these workshops, a little complicated to explain, and it's not my study, so, you know, Take it with a grain of salt, but you can look at the website and get a better idea. So what they're doing is they're meeting with people with lived experience and they're conducting workshops kind of in the arts. So they're they're using photography and poetry and painting, or, you know, whatever things people are interested in doing to help people tell their stories through art or uh, through open mic um, presentations, storytelling. So um yeah, I hope I hope folks will take a look at that um, and uh, read about it. Get in touch with Michael. Uh, if you email me, I can put you in touch with him. If you can't find his contact information on the site, um, I don't know if he's looking to do international work on this. Um, I think the funding right now that they have is, is for New Jersey. Actually, it's for New Jersey and Texas, I think. Um, but you know, Michael is always thrilled to make additional contacts. Um, finally, I I just kind of glanced in the chat. I think people are having trouble sharing the, the paper. Uh, any of the papers that were mentioned in the, um, the PowerPoint, I'm happy to share with anyone. So just reach out to me by my e email and I'll be happy to share that, so. Fun time for, for everything that you added as well. And I think that made me think of, you know, when I came here and analyzing kind of um, how it works in Australia, something that was really, um, interesting is to see how the community really led the response here um, with HIV. And I think it's everywhere, but I think here, the, I would say the connection with the government was really good. I think there was a trust that was established there. So we don't have here in Australia, the CDC, we don't have that um, body. So how the, the Commonwealth reacted or the federal government reacted here is to go to national peak bodies and ask them, what do you think we should do? And confirming with those national peaks, what should be the, the next steps to the HIV response, but also now the HCV response um, and other BDVs and STIs. And I think that's pretty key because now we're gonna get the CDC here in Australia. Um, so it's really key not to forget that that was such a, an important piece of the puzzle that the government or the that body would approach um, the national peaks or the community that organization to ask them what do you need what do you want how do you want it and i think that's also like on a structural level that makes a big difference because um if we want to tackle now you know um with the lives of people living with hiv how to reduce stigma i think it's so important to ask them and ask them what they want what they need how they want it what kind of training do they want and that links to your comment about the the artistic kind of way of expressing yourself and reducing stigma by freeing yourself through art i think there's different projects around so i'm sure in the states there's many as well 
And I think asking people what they need and how they need it really makes a difference in um, how they can heal um, that stigma and how they can free themselves from that stigma. And that can be sustainable because now they have different projects or different trainings or different avenues um, to tackle the stigma themselves. But also as looking at those country organizations, what kind of training do they deliver? How do they deliver them? What kind of partnership do they have with, for example, local health districts or other governments? It, it really makes a, a huge difference. And for people who use drugs, it's the same thing, having you know, those those states or territories organization. And sometimes as well, they do um, HIV and HCV at the same time, depending on the states. Um, they have such a huge resource of people that have amazing knowledge. So I think we need to never forget that uh, we're talking about people, it's their experiences and asking them what they need. Um, and how they want it so that they, they have that self-determination that they can make their own choices about stuff that concerns them and decisions that concerns them, like you were saying, for people in prisons. Yeah, since you mentioned the CDC, um, you know, in the United States, since 2006, our CDC has been recommending routine HIV testing in all healthcare settings, really. Um, but primary care providers are not doing it. And that was another area of research uh, for my doctor of nursing practice project. I did a, an intervention to understand why primary care providers were not doing routine HIV testing. And then a, a colleague of mine and I also um, did a systematic review of the international literature on barriers that primary care providers and facilitators that they report for doing routine testing according to guidelines. And I am a primary care provider, so I feel I have the right to say this, but some of the ex excuses, as I will call them, just are nonsense. You know, not feeling comfortable talking about sex with patients. I'm sorry, that's your role. You know, that's your job. You need to be okay with that. Um, and so there are many, many that we identified, but some of the ones like that, you know, it, it's it, it's stigmatizing, right? It's, it's a stigma that primary care providers shouldn't be talking about sex. No, I'm sorry, that's where it needs to be discussed openly. So, um, and so that, that to me is another kind of structural intervention because if you can get primary care providers saying, okay, you, you know, you're here for your annual exam, we're gonna check your cholesterol, we're gonna check your thyroid and we're gonna do the, your HIV test if you haven't had one, it's just a normal discussion. So it's not a problem, you know, that's, that's the idea. But, um, anyway, I think uh, people have hands up, so I'll keep quiet now. <laughs> That was a great conversation between you two, really good. And I've got a few things to pick up too, maybe you too, Eleanor. But um, shall we hand over to uh, Femi to, for a question or a comment? Over to you. Okay. okay. Greetings, uh, everyone. Can you confirm I could be heard? Yeah, um, Femi, will I be um, actually speaking from Nigeria. So I, I work with the CDC funded uh, implementing partner. So one of the things ha, uh, currently in Nigeria, Delta State, where we're implementing, we are currently having a gender diversity training and KP friendly services training for our KP OSSs and also KP friendly facilities. How have we been able to work around stigma in our implementation programming? Number one. We'll try to ensure a proper setup of five OSS in Delta State, whereby we provide KP friendly access to the KP community. You know, as it stands in Nigeria, Nigeria still has the same sex prohibition act, which is also a major structural challenge to access to healthcare by members of the key population. However, that is the reality we have to face. So in a bid to ensure that key population committee members are on in that access to healthcare, regardless of their sexuality and gender diversity, we've been able to set up key, uh, key population one-stop shop funded by the Center for Disease Control, whereby uh, healthcare access is provided to clients on treatment, routine HIV testing is also done. We also ensure prevention services in form of PrEP uptake are given to these committee members because 
in as much as we're gearing towards epidemic control in Nigeria and also try to as much as possible to ensure that we reduce stigmatization against the community member. So as an organization, we ensure routine uh, training. Like I said, we, we just concluded the first batch of the training for the Asaba Axis. So we are currently running the second batch for the three other OSS. So this is just my contribution as Nigeria. We are still trying to work around free access to healthcare because as it stands, even accessing healthcare by key population members in conventional facilities, it's a bit difficult because the virtue, by virtue of their lifestyle, stigma, because are being the exhibit stigma against them, discrimination, stereotype, and prejudices against them. So that's why US CDC in, in our own uh, benevolence has been able to fund those KPUSs across Nigeria to ensure that uh, on that access are given to key population members. Thank you. Over Thanks. For Thanks, Femi, and, and particularly for joining in from Nigeria. Really appreciate it and, and giving us a very different view. So, Anne or John, would you like to respond to the, the some of the issues that Femi has raised? I just say, first, the struggle to make sure those services are funded and funded by community or that people can feel that they can have access, free access to those services, that's so important. And I, I think the structural stigma is really present because you really want to make sure that the government is investing in those services. And not just for the health side of things, but also the well-being, which is attached to it, um, to make sure that people feel on confident they can access services, they can live a healthy life. Um, I don't have a lot to, to add to this because it's such a different reality to what we have here in Australia and Canada from my experience. So I don't want to say something out of line, but um, just sending you so much positive energy because I, I can imagine the struggle, but also incredible work to make sure your community members have health, access to health services and are able to thrive, um, no matter if they have HIV, if they are gender diverse or if they are um, other community members. Yeah, this, this question of access in the United States is a big problem, uh, particularly because of our system of health insurance that we have here in the United States. Um, it's so complex. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I am a sociologist and a nurse practitioner, but I work in a business school and trying to get people, uh, students who work in the business area to understand how the healthcare system works uh, is, is very much a challenge because it's not something they think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just to give you one example, in the United States, um, in 2010, they passed the Affordable, President Obama passed the Affordable Care Act, which broadened access to insurance coverage. Before that, um, the United States has a system of health insurance called Medicaid, uh, where each state kind of, it's a, it's a federal state uh, government partnership. So it's funded partially by states and partially by the federal government. And so each state kind of has some leeway as to how they implement their, their Medicaid programs. But prior to Obamacare, um, you had to fit into one of five categories to get Medicaid. Medicaid is the insurance for people with low incomes, people living in poverty. Um, but you had to be a pregnant woman, someone with end-stage renal disease, uh, a child, an elderly person, or someone who's disabled. And prior to Obamacare, if you were a single male with no children, um, no disability determination or anything like that, didn't matter how poor you were, you could not get health insurance, you could not get Medicaid coverage. And so what happened was at that time, people who would get infected with HIV would have no options for health insurance uh, until Ryan White would step in. Ryan White provides free services. And so people would advance to an AIDS diagnosis and then they could get a disability determination and then they could get Medicaid coverage. So, some states still operate with that. Under uh, Obamacare, as we call it, or the Affordable Care Act, states had the option of expanding and eliminating these categories uh, for coverage, uh, but some states have chosen not to do that. So it's just one example of how complicated, and again, it's another structural factor. It's something I always tell, um, especially my business school students, because they're not used to thinking this way. Anything that exists in society was a decision made by a human being and it can be changed. So.
uh, the, the system is different. It's easier to access when you're a citizen. But I think there's something to be said as well. If you're uh, an international student or um, a refugee or, you know, a migrant that doesn't have a really high income, even here in Australia to access services, sometimes people think twice about, do I have the money to go and pay to go see a GP for my ear infection or anything? You know, it's, it's really, it can be really a bar barrier to have um, access to those services if you don't have a lot of incomes or if your income goes to school and other things um, or if you have a language barrier as well. But um, I do love that here in Australia with the AIDS Council, the same way I imagined with the organization we were mentioning in the States, that people are able to access free services. So no matter what, you can go to ACON or you can go to Thornhub or, or any other AIDS Council or body positive organization to access different services and contact them so that they can also do some peer advocacy and help you access other services. I think that's quite beautiful and it makes sure that everyone can have access to at least some, to some extent, some um, free services. Over to you, Eleanor. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but I guess it's something that I've been thinking about that, um, you know, stigma towards different conditions and behaviours is different. And so some of our research has looked at um, attitudes among the general community, and we've found that people tend to have the most negative attitudes towards people who inject drugs, for example. And so I, I keep thinking um, when hearing, you know, about bystander intervention, how um, how we would need to change these interventions in order to address different conditions. And I guess I wanted either Anne or, or John in particular to sort of talk about, um, you know, what if you have any reflections on what we would need to consider differently in order to tackle stigma towards injecting drug use specifically. Now, I'll just say well, briefly the intervention. Um, we do talk about morality as one of the uh, factors behind stigma, this guilt versus innocence continuum, uh, particularly in the early days of the epidemic, but you know, it's still there, obviously, that kids like Ryan White, who got HIV through a blood transfusion because he had hemophilia as an innocent victim versus people who inject drugs and, and sex workers um, who, it, you know, it's their own fault, that kind of morality concept and how that comes into feeding into stigma. And so I'll let John speak to that. No, that's, that's a very, very good point. I think so when it comes down to um, People with, you know, um, how would I say that? Um, if you're a pharmacist, if you're a doctor, if you're a researcher, please don't throw rocks at me. Um, and you studied for so long and you know you work really hard, you have so much knowledge, you're so educated, you, you read tons of things every day about different subjects, you're so well aware of the circumstances and everything. But um, don't have the life experience sometimes of those kind of places like injecting drug use or um, living with HIV. You don't have that lived experience. It does make a difference on the reality and how things are perceived. So I think it really comes down to, do you have the humility to ask someone who is living with that condition or is uh, injecting drug what do they want and what do they need and how do they need? I know I'm revealing myself, but I think to feel to have the humility to ask that question, what is needed? And when it's not possible for directly to community members to ask those organizations that have that knowledge and that pool of people with lived experience, um, I think that's really key. I think, and you can see sometimes the government and um, other institutions are like walking the line on like, they want to do it, but then they stop or they, they don't do it anymore. Or they change their mind or they, they go back to ask researchers or they go back to ask um, general practitioners but instead of asking people themselves. I think that's what's really important. And um, um, I thank you, Elena, for, for this beautiful question because just you asking, it just means that you want to know and you want to, so for example, that communication with Abel that we have on a regular basis with Carla and you makes such a big difference because you're asking us, you know, to confirm things like, is this the way we should go? Is this how we should do it? And it makes a difference because we 
we speak on the behalf of people with lived experience. And I think that needs to be said as well for um, the national peak body here, um, for people that live with HIV. It makes such a big difference to ask them what they want, what they need, and they can go and ask the population, their community about what's the best way to do that. But with injecting drug use, I think the stigma is very, very strong, especially there's often if you're women that inject drugs. Again, I don't have that live experience. Um, there's like the stigma is kind of, um, there's that inter intersectionality with that as well. If you're someone who's culturally linguistically diverse, if you're a gender diverse person, it just kind of accumulates and people often have a lack of a hardship as well. Um, and that kind of prevents them from accessing services. So I think it's ready to ask people, um, you know, what they need and how they need it. That will make the biggest difference in the end and investing in PLA services because if we want to reach people that are really hard to reach people um that inject drugs and have you know um a criminal record and you know um have kids and things like that it just it can be really difficult to access those people because they're living such busy lives and they are tackling so many things already but going through peer services mobile services uh, outreach all of that makes such a big difference in the long run um and organizational readiness i, I keep really repeating myself but you know, in all of the settings, including in hospitals, and um, if you're someone who inject drugs and you go because you broke your tibia, and you ask for, you know, you just want to see, um, you want to have medication because, of course, you're in pain, and then you're judged because you had experience of injecting drug use. That's just so unfair, so immoral. Like that, that just makes no sense. And I think that links with what Anne was saying about that judgment, that black and white thinking of good people, bad people. Um, and then you kind of just categorize in one or the other instead of like, you know, even people use drugs, it's a lifelong journey, you know, people can can go into drug use, stop using drugs, it, it just, it changed constantly and depending on the situation. And some people love really healthy and happy lives using drugs and we often forget that as well. And people inject you drugs, same thing. But when you access a service, you don't want your history or disclosing you have HIV or disclosing that you're um, injecting drugs or you have uh, injected drugs to prevent you from accessing medication. That's ridiculous. So I think that there's a lot of like organizational readiness training that should be delivered. And with people with lived experience, I think it could be possible, maybe not community members that are vulnerable, but people that have, um, have done a lot of work to be able to talk and safely disclose and talk about their experience. But I think it is a plus value for those people to be able to share to doctors and practitioners and researchers. And um, I think it makes a big difference. I don't know if that answered your question. No, I think no, that was great. What I see is that in agencies that are currently serving people with HIV and people inject drugs, et cetera, um, and agencies that, that want to, there's, there's that kind of humility. There is that kind of openness, that willingness to, uh, to ask people what it is you need. But when you consider in some states in the United States, um, recently there was a law passed that banned drag shows. And so people face a federal, uh, a, a uh, what am I trying to say? A felony conviction for participating in a drag show. So when you're dealing with that kind of environment, they don't care what's what's acceptable, what what people need. Um, and, and that really gets at the heart of this whole morality principle, what people, what some people think is immoral and et cetera. Um, just how, how do you combat that? And there's no easy answer to that. You're not going to easily change those people's minds. I think the criminalization, oh, sorry, John, you go, you go. I was just going to add, because I think that's so interesting what Anne just said. I think the criminalization of, for example, drug use or of drugs, it has such a huge impact on stigma because then it's criminalized. So a lot of people think, oh, that's immoral. And then um, that creates stigma in itself. And then if you inject drugs or you use drugs, uh, for example, and then um, this is criminalized, you always kind of, you know, you have to get your drug, you have to score by going kind of in the black market or like under the, it just, it creates all of that. And then the drugs aren't regulated. You can't access drug checking services to make sure that the drugs is, um, you know, okay for you, for you not to overdose if it's mixed with something. Um, so the, the criminalization of anything like this is really problematic. And um, for drug user, it is here in Australia, in America as well, uh, Canada too, the depending on states and territories and all of that, but it's still very criminalized. Um, but 
you know, with with the drag show, I think that's the same as well. When you get to the point where you're criminalizing, you know, people participating a drag show that that just that creates a huge amount of stigma for something that you know shouldn't be like that. So I think decriminalizing drugs would really help, and drag show should never be criminalized. That's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, so many levels are ridiculous, and. Um yeah where to go with that there's a bit of discussion in the chat about that the um question I wanted to ask was and, and it came from a comment in the discussion about needing to define stigma and and make it real for people and and John's talked about both organizational readiness and and peer involvement in unpacking that but and in your bystander intervention how did you discuss, describe, define stigma in ways that health workers could get into it and not feel defensive or alienated from the concept that they were somehow bad people or, yeah, really interested to unpack that a bit more. Yeah, sure. So we start with Goffman's definition and kind of say, like, this is the first definition of stigma in the academic literature. And then we go through a discussion of Link and Fallon's approach, which constructs, which talks about stigma in the context of power relationships. And so that idea of power being something behind stigma and discrimination is something that I try to trace throughout the, the entire intervention. And then, you know, I talk about different types of stigma, uh, internalized stigma, associated stigma, et cetera, up to structural stigma. And then we have that snowball survey. So people can kind of talk about types of stigma that they've experienced, seen, and, you know, I, I try to make it as broad as possible. We talk about obesity-related stigma and mental health-related stigma. And that really resonates with people. They can really understand um, that kind of judgment and how it affects people negatively. Um, I've never had anybody re react kind of negatively. It's not, it's not focused on uh, healthcare workers, right? It's focused on the broader society and trying to what I tried to do with this intervention is help people understand that it's the way society is structured and how these norms, these ideas of morality are built into our society that are harmful and that need to be changed to create a more, um, a more uh, hum humble and, and sustaining kind of environment. And, and to help people understand that, you know, you can have stigma because you have, of your HIV status, but you can have stigma because you're obese as well. You know, it, it, it's it's to try to to humanize it in the sense that, you know, it's something we all experience in some way or the other and it affects us uh, every day. So yeah, someone put in the, uh, the definition, oh, Carla, <laughs> put in the definition and in, in, uh, so we start with that. Yeah, we do start with that. And I talk a little bit about his work and, um, but that's just kind of the starting point. And so by the time you get to the snowball survey, people are able to come up with very clear examples of stigmatized uh, behaviors that they've either experienced or, or seen, um, you know, related to, uh, gosh, what was it? There was a woman who gave an example. I don't remember what her son was doing. He was out somewhere doing something and she's an African-American woman. And someone came up to her and said, oh, your son is so, so well-spoken uh, for like for a black boy or something like you know like something very blatantly kind of racist and so people can can definitely relate to to this kind of uh, idea of stigma well we've got two minutes before we we close anything um john or Anne that you wanted to say that we haven't covered yet yeah i i, I guess maybe oh, sorry have if, if you want to send out uh, if you haven't already you want to send out the slide decks um, of the intervention itself if you want to take a look at that give me feedback I, you know I, I always like to to hear from people so I just want to say thank you Adam, for the theme for your presentation and your work you do and it's so empowering and it's it already, already relieves a bit of stigma just to hear you talk about how you're doing all of this and you know empowering people and helping them understand the stigma better. And I, I just want to say to everyone, I talked today again. Um, I don't have HIV, so I talk only my personal experiences. And I always ask people living with HIV or people with inject drugs what they need. I think that's really key to the solution here. And um, having you know those amazing trainings that can help getting you know allies and people to support. Uh, reducing stigma in all its manifestations. 
All right. Well, we I think it's time to say um, thank you. It's great. Even in the chat, there's such a lovely discussion going on. Thank you for joining today. And thank you, Anne and John, for um, being such wonderful uh, participants and um, discussants here and, and to Ellen and my co-host today. So we'll stay tuned. We'll have another one coming up in a couple of months and um, you'll get the link to the recording of this if you registered. So thanks again, Anne and John, and see you all next time. Mm -hmm.